back. Thank you very much for staying with us uh, until this time. Uh, the last session of the day uh, will be a presentation by Melanie on conceptual abstraction and analogy in natural and artificial intelligence. So Melanie, thank you so much for joining us and we're very curious about your talk. So over to you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me and thanks to all of you over in Europe for staying up so late for this. <laughs> I'll try and keep it uh, relatively short. Um, so, um, back in 1955, McCarthy et al. wrote a proposal for the Dartmouth, the famous Dartmouth Summer Research Project, uh, in which uh, the the uh, participants were supposed to find solve cer certain problems in AI, such as using language, forming abstractions and concepts, which is the topic of this talk, and uh, uh, other kinds of problems in AI, which still remain largely open problems. But this one in particular is of great interest today in AI. We've seen you know, the deep learning revolution where um, deep neural networks have excelled in, in vision, language, game playing, robotics, and so on. But a big question still remains is to how to understand what exactly these machines are learning. And it does seem that some of the time, at least, the machines are not learning the concepts that we humans have in mind. So this is a, a, a very simple example of this. One of my students trained a deep neural network to classify images as having animals or not having animals. And then for his PhD, he was looking at how to, how to do explainable AI. So he looked into what the machine had actually learned. And it seemed that even though it did very well on this data set of National Geographic images in classification, what part of what it had learned was that when there's an animal in the photo, the background is blurrier than when there's not an animal in the photo. And that blurry background, of course, was easier to uh, use as a statistical clue to classify images correctly. And we've seen this in, in many papers, this kind of um, idea of machine learning not really getting the same concept that we humans get. This, this particular group looked at uh, a neural network that had uh, been trained on ImageNet and uh, is able to identify fire trucks with 99% confidence. But if they Photoshop the um, objects in weird poses, the network is has a very high confidence of completely a different concept. So, uh, what are these machines actually learning? Another example is in the game playing domain. Deep Mind trained. Uh, DeepQ learning networks to play Atari video games. One of them, Breakout, you know, is a game played where you move a little paddle with a joystick that hits a ball and um, collides with bricks, which explode. And um, that's at least our human conception of the game. The machine learned from watching pixels and taking actions. And it seemed that it, it, it's not learning these concepts that we humans learn because when it was tested, a, a, a similarly trained um, machine was tested on a version of Breakout with a paddle shifted up a few pixels, it could not succeed in playing the game. It couldn't transfer what it had learned in the standard format to this very slightly modified format. We've all seen adversarial examples which can strangely change the classification of vision systems here just by putting uh, stickers in special positions on stop signs makes the um, vision system uh, classify this as a speed limit 80 sign, which could be dangerous for a self-driving car. So what it seems to be is that these machines are learning what we might call perceptual categories instead of concepts, where concepts are much more rich more detailed and based not on um, dividing up a set of terms like dog, cat, boat, bird, etc., cetera, in, into uh, regions in some high dimensional space, but rather to actually learn generative simulations. 
So this one example, simple example, is the notion of bridge. You can imagine a deep neural network trained to recognize bridges, and it might get all of these ones right, but it does, doesn't have the capacity to extend its concept to recognize more abstract uh, ideas. Here's a, a strange image I came across, which is a water bridge. So there's a highway underneath here, and the water bridge is built to let boats cross over the highway. So it's kind of an inversion of the usual bridge, but it's something that we humans can understand very quickly because we know a lot about the function of bridges and um, what, how they're used. We can also recognize things like bridges made of ants or bridging your hands or the bridge of a nose, the bridge of a song, all of these abstract extensions of these, this concept other examples, you know, bridging the gender gap. Joe Biden says he's a bridge to a new generation of leaders. We hardly even register this as a metaphor when we hear it, we just know what it means. And we can get a visual picture of, for instance, Joe Biden with his body stretched out between the different generations of leaders. So these kinds of metaphorical abstractions are really how we think about concepts. And you can just go on and on um, with different kinds of notions of bridges that we humans are very good at. And how do we get machines to understand these concepts? Hofstadter, in his, one of his papers, defined a concept as a packet of analogies, which I think is a really nice definition. And it definitely captures this idea of, say, the bridge, which is uh, all of these things are really analogies that we're talking about, analogies and metaphors. So how do we get machines to learn concepts rather than perceptual categories and make analogies? So this is what I'm really interested in these days. Um, in this talk, I'm gonna talk about a little bit about how people are trying to approach these issues, especially via idealized domains, which is one of the main ways people are looking at this sort of thing. For example, there's been a lot of work recently on this domain called Raven's Progressive Matrices, which we'll talk about, Bongard problems, a domain I worked on on letter string analogies, and more recently, what, uh, something called the Abstraction and Reasoning Corpus, which I'll, I'll take you through. And I'll talk about some selected AI methods for studying abstraction and analogy in those domains, including um, deep neural networks, Bayesian programming or Bayesian rule induction, and my own copycat architecture. And then I'll wrap up with some thoughts about how to make progress on this kind of study. So Raven's progressive matrices are a very old kind of intelligence test, visual intelligence test uh, devised in the early part of the, the 1900s. And I don't know if you've ever encounter this, the idea here is that you have this matrix of um, eight figures and then a blank, and you're supposed to choose from uh, the figures below the multiple choice, which one that fills it in the best. And there's different objects, you know, like these rectangles and different shapes, different kinds of um, textures, different orientations. There's a lot of different things you can play with. And you can probably see that, you know, number five is the right choice here or here. You know, we look at um, this thing and we can pretty quickly see that the third element in the row is the sort of um, union of the uh, two uh, elements to the left of it. But it's been claimed by psychologists that um, performance on this test is highly correlated with human intelligence. Okay, so I'm not going to get into here whether that's valid or not, or whether IQ tests are valid, but rather using this kind of domain as a way for AI systems to make progress on con conceptual formation and abstraction. Okay, so before I talk about that, let me talk about a different domain, the Bongard problems, which are a really interesting set of visual concept formation problems developed by Bongard, in, listed in his book, Pattern Recognition, which was published in 1960s in Russian. Um, so Bongard problems are um, 
formed by having a set of uh, examples on the left and a set of examples on the right, and your goal is to describe what's the difference or what's the concept being represented here, like large versus small or um, unfilled versus filled shape, vertical versus horizontal, uh, right versus left. So these are all pretty simple concepts. But the interesting thing is um, there's only, you can think of this as, as a, as kind of a classification problem, but with only a few examples, very small number of examples. And yet we humans are very good at, at uh, recognizing the underlying concept. Here's some slightly more um, abstract ones. If you look at the difference between the um, left side and the right side, you might describe it as the figure has kind of a neck. Okay, so that's a concept maybe you haven't really thought about before, a figure having a shape, having a neck. But it's very easy for us to take our concept like neck and, and apply it here, kind of a, bring up a new concept on the fly. And here we have horizontal versus vertical necks. Um, this is an easy one for humans, not so easy for neural networks. Um, same versus different, um, inside versus outside. This is a kind of abstract uh, representation of three versus four, and so on. So Bongard problems, people have been applying, trying to apply machine learning systems to them for a while. I'll talk a little bit about one example. Um, my own early work was looking at analogies in this idealized domain of letter strings. Here we have what we called two, some situations, a situation, a string ABC, changes to a string ABD, now do the same change, quote unquote same, to PQRS or analogous change. Okay, there's many different possibilities for the answer, but most people would say PQRT, sort of describing the um, change at a particular level of abstraction. Um, you can make these analogies as um, explore different things like grouping letters or reversing strings or sort of cleaning up strings. Um, and the idea here was that these are very idealized situations with objects, relations, groups, actions, events, which was meant to be a tool for exploring very general issues of abstraction and analogy making. And um, okay, so those are some examples of domains. So let's look at a few different uh, methods. I'm not gonna really have time to talk in detail about these, so I'm gonna talk very briefly about the Bayesian program induction, but that's an, and I, I'm happy to talk more about that um, at the end if people are interested. Okay, so deep neural networks have been applied to some of these domains. In particular, lately there's kind of been a, a flurry of work on these Ravens progressive matrices. So the idea here, so here's one simple way of applying a neural network to, uh, you just take 16, the eight images in the matrix here, the eight possible answers, you give them as the input to a deep neural network. Um, and the output is a probability distribution over the possible eight possible answers. Okay, so, and so the problem is, of course, is when we have neural networks that we need lots and lots of training examples, especially if the network has like 50 layers. Um, this group created a data set by generating these problems automatically. They created a data set which had 42,000 training examples and 14,000 test examples. And the way that they created it um, stochastically was to make a, define a stochastic image grammar where at each level of this um, sort of hierarchical grammar, you can choose a particular uh, kind of structure for the problem here, inside, outside. And then that has some uh, children in the tree, like define the outside component and the inside component, then figure the layout, figure out what shapes to put in, how many of them, and so on. So you can imagine with, with um, this grammar being defined with the different kinds of 
structures that the humans sort of pre-specify. You can just sample from these nodes and um, generate any number of these problems. So that's what this group did. And they were able to find that um, <clears throat> some ResNet-based uh, neural networks were able to, to, to do very well, in fact, better than the humans they tested on these problems on average. Okay, but now we have the problem. What is it that these machines actually learned? And it turns out that it's, it's so not only does, is there a problem that it requires this corpus, and so you have to generate it automatically, but it's, these neural networks are not transparent. But one group figured out that there, this, this data set actually had a kind of bias. Um, so there were a lot of papers that kind of competed for state of the art on this particular data set. But then someone noticed that there was a problem. The way that the answers were created was by taking the correct answer and generating eight answers, eight possibilities. One was correct and every other one had one feature uh, changed. So the feature might have been the shape, the size, the coloring, uh, the number. And so the problem is then if you have the answers and you have that way of generating answers, you can actually take a shortcut, kind of a cheat, where you just say, what's the, for each possible feature, what's the majority of that feature? So here we see for shape, the majority is pentagon. For coloring, the majority is black. For size, the majority is large. And so then we can say, well, that's, the right answer. And in fact, when they did an experiment that says, train on the candidate answers only, um, don't even look at the context matrix, they were able to do as well as um, the previous state of the art um, ResNet on this problem. So this is, you know, we see this again and again <clears throat> in these um, manual, this, these, these sort of automatically generated data sets that there can be these hard to notice biases that makes it hard to figure out exactly what the system learned and allows it to possibly take these shortcuts which don't require it to solve the problem that you really want it to solve. Um, I was going to talk about um, this Bayesian rule induction. I don't really have enough time so I'm going to skip that for now but it was kind of an interesting approach to Bongard problems but the, Big problem is you have to build in a huge number of priors and do a, a very large number, very large uh, search. But I did want to talk about the architecture that I worked on with Hofstadter, the copycat architecture, because I think it's very relevant here. Um, this was particularly applied to these letter string analogies, okay? But of course, the architecture was meant to be more general, to be a general architecture for analogy making and abstraction. So I'll talk a little bit about the generality of it in a little while, but here's how it worked. Um, the system has what's called a concept network, which is a kind of a symbolic structure, which has all the concepts and their relationships. I won't go into details in that, but I'll talk about it at the end if you're interested. But it has things like successorship of letters, you know, it's all the knowledge about this letter string domain. Uh, it knows about grouping and so on. And then we have this workspace, which is kind of like a short-term memory or a blackboard, if you will, in which these perceptual agents, which we called codelets, there's small pieces of code that are really agents of the concepts in the network that try and instantiate different concepts. And it's really a multi-agent system in which these um, agents co uh, collaborate and co uh, compete to instantiate their hypotheses about what's going on. These agents are stochastic, but they do things like try and build groups, try and build relationships between letters or um, correspondences between uh, aspects of different strings. And all of these were controlled by a temperature variable that um, the temperature controlled the amount of randomness with which these agents make decisions 
but there's also a feedback. It's not just like simulated annealing. It's, it's a feedback where the temperature itself is set by how much coherent structure has been built by these agents, sort of how well the program assesses that it's making sense of the analogy. So I'm going to talk about some, um, let's see what happened. Oh, here's my slide. Sorry for, I'm going to give you a, a, show you a little movie of the program working. This is actually a version of the program called Medicat that was uh, created by one of my fellow um, graduate students back, back um, in Doug Hofstetter's group. So here's this problem, right? ABC goes to CBA, PPQQRR goes to what? And what you're going to see is that these agents coming in and trying to build s structures that represent these strings and make analogies between them. And so you're going to see these little lightning bolts, which are agents trying to figure out if there's a particular relationship or correspondence they should build. The dotted line means it's weak, the dashed line means it's stronger, and you'll start to see solid lines, which means that they're even stronger. And so there's this collaboration among these different agents making up these um, workspace data structures. There's also competition, like should this A correspond to the big P or should it correspond to the small P? You could you sometimes see that kind of competition coming up like here. And you can see the temperatures which started out at 100 going down very far as the system uh, builds its representations and starts to make sense of the problem. And that feeds back to um, control the randomness. And so you got here, reverse direction of string, and then it found that the analogy was, well, this is a string made of groups, so reverse direction of the, all of the groups. Okay, so that was a little demo. Let me um, get out of that, but talk about some important ideas from this approach. So in contrast to the feedforward neural network approach, here we have the perception unfolding dynamically over time. That is that these agents are gradually building up these structures and um, not like a feed forward pass through a neural network, they're continually integrating sort of top down concepts with bottom up processes. And not only that, it's not that like we build a representation and then make an analogy those two processes are interleaved. And they're also performed by a distributed set of stochastic agents that are driven by this temperature, which is controlled by feedback. It's a way of continually integrating prior knowledge like that's in the concept network with the bottom up perceptions and perceived context that's going on. And finally, we see because of this temperature, we see at the beginning, very bottom up, parallel, random mode of processing. And then there's kind of a gradual transition to a more top down, deterministic, attentive mode of processing, which is actually something that is known to happen in, in human perception. But there's a number of limitations to this uh, approach. Copycat's architecture is fairly ad hoc. You know, it's not like a Bayesian architecture that 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 is has you can prove theorems about uh, it's like most architectures in AI is not clear how how general it is how it can kind of scale up to more complex problems the concepts are given they're not learned so a human created the concept network namely me um, the system doesn't learn its concepts and the concepts are static. So it can't come up with new concepts on the fly. So more recently, um, Francois Cholet from Google wrote this really interesting paper called On the Measure of Intelligence. If you haven't read it, I recommend it. Um, and in this paper, he, he kind of goes through a lot of the same issues that I've been talking about with respect to um, like deep learning, being able to take shortcuts, and uh, talking about how it is that we should actually measure intelligence in machines. And he comes up with a, what he called the ARC corpus, the abstraction and reasoning corpus, where, and these are a set of kind of copycat-like 
problems, except they're visual. So if you say this grid changes to this grid, but now we have multiple examples, this grid changes to this grid, this grid changes to this grid, what, what do you do to this grid? Well, you can, I'm sure, see the pattern here of you know, the horizontal arrangement of colors, the vertical arrangements of colors, and now you know, you could, I'm sure you could build, generate the answer to this. And Cholet actually, um, he, he created about, a th I think, a thousand of these little visual analogy problems. Some of them are really clever. And this one kind of plays with two versus three dimensions, you know, because we, we humans sort of <laughs> think of this blue stripe, for instance, as continu is continuing, it's just behind the green stripe. Uh, and they're, they're really quite a great set. I'm not sure if he, bef I don't think he had seen the Bongard problems before he invented this, but they, they're sort of reminiscent of them. Um, he set up a training set of 400 tasks and then an evaluation set of 600, which he did not publish. He only published the 400 and set this up as a Kaggle challenge offering $20,000. Um, and um, that it's over now, but um, in the challenge, the very best program solved 20% of the test cases, you know, they, they um, which was really impressive, actually, because these are really hard. But uh, Cholet told me that, that these winning entries were essentially brute forcing a handcrafted search space. So it was a little disappointing. Nobody really came up with anything very general. So how do we make progress on these issues of abstraction and analogy and AI? I just want to talk about a few issues and then I'll talk about some of my current work approaching this. So there's this question, do we design idealized versus real world domains? You know, idealized domains allow us to, to study the phenomenon in a very stripped down way and not be sort of distracted by some of the difficulties and, and complications of real world domains. On the other hand, it's hard to know if these things are actually gonna be able to scale up. Should we, should we allow multiple choice tasks like the Ravens problems where, which allows the possibility of cheating or should we require the system to generate its answers to, to be, um, showing that it actually understands what it's doing by generating, which is much harder. How much training should we allow? You know, with the Raven's problems, it seems it's very strange to me to train a system on 40,000 examples for this test that's really meant to measure general intelligence. So they're training for a very specific test, but it's not supposed to measure somebody who, you know, you don't, your kid doesn't sit down and look through 40,000 of these problems before they take the test. It's meant to be a, a, essentially a zero shot intelligence test. And how much prior knowledge should be given? And what should that prior knowledge be? You know, there's kind of a religion in the uh, deep learning community that everything has to be learned, that we should have a blank slate end to end learning. But that makes it hard like for instance in the in the example i gave of um deep minds reinforcement learning program on breakout where it had no prior knowledge of things like objects or forces or you know the kinds of things that we humans come with in our intuitive physics being able to um use that to understand what's going on in a very sort of generalizable way so Elizabeth Spelke has proposed, she's a developmental psychologist who has proposed that all humans have something she calls core knowledge that we're either born with or develop very early on as infants. And that is notions of objects and relationships between objects, spatiotemporal motion, uh, the notion of agentness, you know, that you have something has agency versus something that's not, does not have agency and goal directedness and some minimal amount of numerosity, being able to count to some small amount. Um, so Cholet in his paper recommended that that's all that people should be allowed to 
program into their systems to solve these arc problems. But sort of in, in a research, you know, when you're actually getting down to the details, how do you actually figure out what to program in? And then a big question, how do we evaluate the results? We've seen in, in machine learning that just using accuracy as a measure kind of sweeps a lot of things under the rug and allows things to seem a lot more intelligent than they actually are. And the question is, should we be trying more to measure performance in terms of robustness to changes in the data, some kind of scaling to more complicated uh, situations, being able to transfer learning to, to, to different domains, um, all of these things probably should be incorporated in our evaluation. And finally, if we have some results on a benchmark, how do we figure out what that's going to teach us about real world concepts or analogies? So I don't have definitive answers to all these things. And I'd love to get into a discussion with um, everybody here, because I'm sure you've thought about these issues a lot. But um, just as to conclude, um, trying to figure out how much time I have left. Um, a little bit of time. I just want to tell you a little bit about some very preliminary work I've done with some of my students on um, recognizing what we call visual situations. So this is trying to use the copycat-like architecture in a more real-world type of domain. So we know that um, you know deep neural networks are really good at object recognition, and um, but they're not as good at recognizing object relationships or in particular more complex situations that involve multiple objects. So here's a kind of visual concept that all of us humans are familiar with, you know, walking a dog. And um, we know we can recognize that in many different kinds of situations, you know, cluttered, you can sort of say, where's the dog walking? part of this image and you can very quickly kind of focus in on it and ignore all this other clutter. And we can see things like, you know, this leash would be very hard to see uh, if without the context of the walking the dog situation, but we can recognize it using that context, you know, and, you know, we can just go on and on. So the idea here, so the task we looked at is suppose you just have some concepts the concept of walking a dog, which is defined in terms of some objects and some stereotypical relationships between those objects that you learn. The goal is to take a new image and ground these, this situation, not just, the, not just the object categories, but the whole situation in the image. So build bounding boxes that have a good fit to your model, your learned model of this concept. And Here's the notion of a grounding score, where how well it fits the model. So here's what our system did, which is still in a work in progress, but it's trying to sort of use the uh, copycat-like multi-agent architecture to um, do this task. So we have two kinds of models. One is the usual kind of object appearance model that says, you know, this looks like a dog walker, this looks like a leash, this is like the dog, independent of any other object, but also the situation model, which says, is like, how do these different objects relate to each other in terms of, for instance, the size, their relative size, their relative, um, sh their shape, like their aspect ratio, their locations, and you can put in some other kinds of attributes as well. We built a simple multivariate Gaussian using a, a, a relatively small set of um, training images, about 300 training image, labeled training images. And that was what our situation model. Okay, so let me show you a little video of our system at work. So here's our, what our system does. It, it has some prior knowledge that it's learned from training data of the likely location of each object category. In, um, so here they're just like, this is just a probability um, distribution over locations, you know, mapping these onto the whole image. And um, some prior log normal distributions for the aspect ratio, that's the shape, 
and the relative size of the box that's, that's here, the relative area. Um, and now what our system's gonna do is it's gonna start having these agents come in and sampling from these various distributions and trying to use both its object appearance model and its situation model to find the dog walking situation. Okay, so you'll see these little boxes and so a lot of them are gonna fail. The, the, the white ones are sort of the exploration, the red ones are, have been strong enough to be instantiated. So now the system thinks, um, okay, if I pause this for a second, it thinks this is a dog walker and this is the dog. This, this has a very strong dog walker kind of object appearance, but um, the, it's not a great fit for these mod the models, right? Because um, if this is the dog walker, here's where it thinks the dog should be. So this is the dog location conditioned on the dog walker. This is the dog walker location conditioned on the dog and it's not like a great fit. And then here's the leash location conditioned on both of them. And these now have also been conditioned these uh, on, on what's already these red boxes. But let's see what happens if we keep going. So the system um, keeps trying to sample from with, with a temperature from these um, distributions and it can use its context like the fact of where the leash should be uh, to, to try and, you know, see this thing that's almost, that's really hard to distinguish on its own from like a crack in the street or something, but it does, it's, that context makes it strong enough to recognize that's a leash. And now there's a very strong sort of um, probability of where the dog walker is and how big and what shape it is, which allows the system to zero in on that. And it, it decides to stop probabilistically based on its temperature. So that kind of thing we've, we, okay, let me try and get out of this. Um, so we've, we've done this with a few different situations. Here's, the do, here's a, an experiment we did where we said, what if we have 5,000 non-dog walking images, negative images, and we take our dog walking images and ask, what's the probability of, if you had a single image, positive image in this, C of 5,000 negative images, how many, of, where, where, how, many, how many times would it be rated um, in terms of its grounding score uh, higher than N? So what this says is um, something like um, point, like at, at N equals 10, 50% of our dog walking images would be rated higher than um, the negative images. And here, you know, like 75% will be rated higher than uh, in this top 60. So this is a recall. Um, and we compared it with a few other methods. Um, I can give you a reference if you want. This, this IRSG is a method that a group at Stanford was using on a similar kind of problem. And our system, which was an act, this active perception system, was doing much better than these other methods. But we still have, you know, the, we were giving it fairly typical dog walking problems. But if you want to talk about analogy and sort of how, you know, flexible people are, as I did like with the example of the bridge, we can have a lot of non-prototypical dog walking, like, you know, how do we tell the system that this is an example of dog walking with all of these dogs? If you'd seen somebody walking a dog and then you saw this, you'd probably say, yeah, that's also a dog walker. This is an analogous to a dog walking. That's a cat, right? And we certainly, we know that cats are not, they're not fond of walking on leashes, but uh, they do. This is a really weird one where we have this iguana, this is its leash, right? So this is a real analogy uh, where you're sort of, the role of the animal and the leash are played by the same thing. And then you can get all kinds of weird uh, variations like people on skateboards, people on bikes, people on bikes and dogs on skateboards. <laughs> and, you know, these are really humorous uh, analogies. You know, cars walking dogs and dogs walking dogs. And this again, this is just to kind of give an illustration of how flexible our concepts are 
and how, how we can abstract them in so many different directions. So we're far from being able to get our machine to recognize all these different examples, but that's kind of the ultimate goal is to be, allow our machine to make flexible analogies. Okay, so um, all of this is, I talked about a lot of these issues in a recent article in AI Magazine, um, and also in my recent book, uh, which uh, is really an overview of modern AI meant, meant for a broad audience. Thanks for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you so much, Melanie. It was a wonderful talk. I don't know if you can see us. Can you? Uh, I just no. Yeah, I okay, can. now you can. <laughs> the camera unfortunately died. I can't so yeah, thank you very much. You. It was, I, can't, it was... I, I can't see the other participants. Uh, can you? Yeah, I think our video is the only one that's switched on currently. Yeah, the other videos are switched. On. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> There's another person in so. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, thank you. Uh, we can start with some questions. So, Zabo, yeah, you can start. So, um, for example. There's 